Welcome to another episode of the Paragon Path. This is a special episode attached to episode two of season two, Small Team Tactics. This is the, uh, we're going to call it the Aggressive Small Team Tactics one hour special. Um, I run you through a pretty quick and aggressive uh, list of basic maneuvers, basic tactics, how to build your team, some real simple strategy, and uh, a few questions and answers on small teams. The content that I present here is all informed by the discussions that I've had with Dizzy and Jamie. And unfortunately, Jamie isn't able to make it to this episode, this section of this episode. So it's just me presenting the information. But uh, I think it goes really well. And we have some questions at the end that unfortunately do not get recorded by the computer. So uh, I will answer those questions, but I will also feed in the information of what those questions are asking about. So. This is, again, a pretty heavy graphic episode. If you are listening to this on Spotify or any of the other traditional podcast episodes, I would recommend you jump over to YouTube so you can get the visuals. There are quite a bit of graphics that are involved here, and I will be linking uh, a couple of the graphics I use in the description and the bio so that we can make sure that you guys have access to this thing and you can use it as you need. Enjoy and stay on the path. Welcome to the Paragon Path. Let's get on it. Okay, so this is small team specials, uh, small team tactics with Merrick. Uh, if Jay's available, he's going to jump in with us as well. He had a family emergency, so um, he's going to be either late or not here today. But a lot of the information I have, we talked over last night. So starting off, when you build a team, when you're thinking of small teams, we got to define what that is. Our definition that we liked the best was five or less, but more than one. So you know, five to two is your small team. Um, small teams occur in tournament formats. If you're looking for, if it's a, a 5v5, a 2v2, a 3v3, 4v4, anything like that, they occur very naturally in battle games because small teams working together get things done. And especially for battlefield commanders, it's a lot easier to deal with 10 groups of 10 than 100 individual people. So if you can consistently create small teams uh, or, or medium-sized teams, you're going to be more effective on for the larger group of the battlefield. It's very hard uh, to deal with two people working as a group than it is to deal with two people working as individuals because if you split them, you have a better time. A, a prime example of this is if you guys have seen Lily on the battlefield in like 5v1s, he backs up a lot and runs around so that he gets 1v1s against all of those players because they're not playing as a team, they're playing as individuals. And then he wins that fight because he turns them all into 1v1s that he knows he can win. Prime example of individual versus group. Um, so we have defined our full team. We have defined our small team. Building it is important. And there's an aspect of this we're not going to talk about a lot because it's a rabbit hole that takes years. Uh, building your team based on class matters so much more about what you're doing than like general rules we can go over in an hour um there are so many abilities in v8 there are so many enchantments and magic and rules and combinations of classes that work that i have a couple examples of what i think are good to to use but not like this is what you have to do every time it matters on who you have in your team uh, what they're willing to play, what equipment they're willing to bring, and what they know how to do. So we're going to kind of avoid that for the moment, but we can talk about that more in questions as well. Um, the main thing that we have seen large success in in small teams specifically is you put armor first. Um, sorry, I'm bringing up the chat to make sure I'm not missing any questions. So if you have small teams, armor is essentially extra lives. If you can pack as much armor onto your small team as possible, they're going to survive more situations than if they didn't have that armor. The next step is to get them anti-magic or protection from magic in some sort, preferably ESOL, mainly because then they can still be healed and their stuff can be mended. You can still do touch magics on them, like releases if they get affected by you know a spell law or whatever, but they are immune to the verbal magics, which cause most problems in small teams, which is crowd control. 
So uh, warders are really nice to have that kind of thing, but monks can also be effective. The problem is they counteract your armor that you want. Uh, next is a fun little balance rule that we've encountered. Pole arms are bad in when you have two people, but they're amazing when you have three, four, five, six plus. In two people, it's really hard to get the pole arm and whoever else you have moving together and defending or attacking a location together because the pole arm needs to keep moving in a way that is counterproductive for the other player to be able to make attacks or defend them. If they're not moving as a complete unit, and one of them gets separated, that pole arm is dead, you now have a 2v1, that 2v1 is very heavily stacked against the one, it's going to end up with more of a problem. In three, now you have sides and abilities for the pole arm to move back and forth between the two and to defend themselves a little bit better, and they can still cause damage at range. So in 3v3s, 4v4s, 5v5s, Bringing range, uh, specifically a pole arm or a great weapon, is going to give you a large advantage. Um, in the situations that I've seen and what Jay has seen, the speed pole is the better option, mainly because it's not about crushing and breaking your opponents. It's about getting as many shots off as possible. That pole arm has to be the most active member of your team, and it's extremely tiring. Um, I mean, we're, we're talking like six or seven shots a second. Like you got to be just like popping, trying to get people to move and react to your pole so that if one of them runs, they've now created their own 3v1 because they've run the pole. The pole can still defend against other people, but the two others can defend the pole and take out that one. And now you have a 3v2. Same thing happens again. Someone tries to run the pole. You crush that person or you destroy that person and you keep moving on. In fours is the same thing, except you have now an additional flank person. Fives, you now have two flanks, and you can start getting into interesting movements and tactics in that way. So armor, immunity to magic, not far range, but range when you're building your team. Um, then you want support. Uh, support often comes either in the fashion of somebody that has throwies if it's a like a militia game or a uh, ditch style game um or somebody that's able to be the the hyper movement flank so in this example we'll switch over to my little graphic So in our little graphic here, we're looking at uh, four opponents. They're labeled things. We're going to ignore that for now. We're just going to call them green enemy, yellow enemy, blue enemy, and red enemy. And we have brown, white, red, and purple. So in this scenario, we have two boards, a Pullman, and a warrior with a flat with a flow now the main reason that we give this warrior the flow is for movement there are flank and our support but there also are like dps essentially the paladin this this pole arm here is going to be our main dps but this is can be a secondary dps and can create openings for us they can support by moving out here drawing a couple people to them and then we have three people able to go up and deal with two people. If they can survive this fight and we win one of we win this fight here, we've now created a 4v2. We've created a 3v2 in our favor here. They don't even have to win this fight technically. They just have to make this a concern. Like if they keep backing up and making these people chase or they can keep chasing them, which is even better. It's a little harder because then you have to keep your, your aggression up. But if you can chase them away and keep these two out of this fight, you've created a 3v2. You're supporting your team by being offensive. So that's the, the support um, aspect. Uh, 
sticking with this, we'll go back here. Did someone have a question? Sorry, I heard some audio. All right, no, we're going to keep going. All right, so we've kind of helped design a team. Um, you started with your your armor, you got some pole, uh, and you've got support slash assistance. Uh, the, the class aspect of support can either be, you know, enchantments, resin, healing, stuff like that. Um, but it kind of depends on what you're doing. If you're in a dungeon, you're going to have a different need for support than if you're on a large battlefield or, or if you're in a ditch line or this, that, or the other thing. There's there's plenty of different options that you're going to have to kind of figure out as you play each scenario. And there's some general rules you can follow, but they're, they all have downfalls. They all have pros and cons, and they create different situations and different uh, problems that are hard to just give general rules for, which is kind of what we're trying to go here. So we're going to start with some basic layouts that I think are going to give, uh, and we're going to ignore, we're going to ignore, uh, armor and we're going to ignore class for this, for these kind of layouts, because when it comes down to it, these layouts are going to be moderately successful with or without the class and the armor. So in, we're going to start with a 2v2. So we'll move our, our two extras here. Because remember, we start with armor. So in a ditch style, we don't have armor, but we do have shields. And shields are essentially armor you wear on your shoulder, like for the most part. So We'll make this easy. We'll do this too. And at any point during this, if anybody has any questions or or uh, like wants me to go over something more in detail, just speak up or put a note in the comments, and we'll uh, we'll delve into that a little bit more. We got an hour. We're gonna use it. So two v two. Normally, what I'd recommend is bring your best kit. Whatever you are best with is what you should probably be bringing. If that happens to be sword and board, both righty sword and board, great. If that happens to be uh, down stick and long or down stick and a short sword and the other person has uh, a sword and board, because sword and board is very, very common, do that. You're in the small groups. Your efficiency matters so much more than in larger groups. So bring what you're comfortable with, but also remember to bring something that you can move with your teammate for. Because it's going to be difficult. If you bring a pole arm and they bring uh, flow, it's kind of hard unless you both know each other's tempos to keep each other defended and to get the attacks off. Because now you're playing at two different ranges and you're playing at different situations. You're, you're kind of going to be playing a tricky game. Now, that example has its exceptions. There are... Uh, Two of our, our knights from CK in the past have done that and have been very, very successful. They're also very, very good at those things. So bring what you're comfortable with, discuss that with your partner, and then move on from there. So in 2v2s, there's not a lot of positions because there's only two people. Like you have, you can start on the right, you can start on the left. It's pretty much it. What you can do once you get in these positions is mess with the opponents. If we start with brown and red here and red and we'll call this maroon. Maroon decides that they have the best bet against brown and yellow has the best bets against red. Immediately, looking at that, we just play crossover. As we step up, we change positions. Their plan has gone out the window. We have now crossed over and we have an advantage. This, this team, which is going to be the ones with uh, weapons, is going to be us. We have created the opportunity of screwing up their plans. So... Now they have to react. At this range, if they try to cross over, they basically just create another 2v1, which is, you know, not a good option in 2v2s. So this, that that is one simple, quick little maneuver. 
Um, the other one that is very popular with those fighters that have wheels, they like to move a lot. Not the, the wheels as the fighting company, but like people that really like to run. It's called Turn and Burn. Uh, basically, run out and turn so that you have two 1v1s. This works a lot better if you're individually better than the opponents, because now you're not dealing with a 2v2, you're dealing with 1v1s that you know you can win. The trick here is if they turn to face you, they put their back to your friend. If they can, if this player steps over and tries to get a shot, your friend can just step in and stab them, and you can step up and play this game with him, and now you have a 2v1. It's it's like surprisingly simple tactics because it is a small number of players, but they're they're extremely effective if you know your capabilities. Um, turn and burn can also work with. I mean, any of these that I've listed can work with pretty much any combination, uh, except for a Pullman in two v twos. Those are those are a little trickier, and I don't I don't think we really have time to go into every aspect of that mechanic um so those are two really quick 2v2 scenarios um obviously if you turn in you you end up in a 2v3 or a 2v4 you're going to have different tactics but ideally you never end up with a situation where you are the lesser and they are the greater if you do try to create those opportunities uh where it's two of you against two of them or two of you against one of them normally unless they're working as a team, certain people are going to charge and you can pick and choose who you're going to deal with, take them out, and now you've created a better situation. If you're the lesser team, the main thing you have to do is move. If you're not moving your feet, if you're not getting out of the way and creating opportunities for you to get kills, um, you're not going to win that fight. It's, it's going to be very difficult for you to actually take on four people when it's only two of you, unless you're both very, very good compared to them. Okay. Um, the thing to also note in 2v2s is there's not really a flank because everywhere is a flank. There's only two people. So if someone says flank in a 2v2, it's basically just a modified turn and burn. You're just rotating until you get them to turn. It's not really flanking. It's more of uh, splitting the team. Uh, stepping up to threes, we definitely want to bring our pole into play. Now, let's assume they are also smart and bring a pole. We're going to put it on maroon here. So let's assume they're smart and they bring a pole and we're actually mirrored in our setup. So we have two boardmen and a pole versus two boardmen and a pole. In this scenario, you just have to have a better pullman if you're going to run at them. If you're going to straight up decide that this is your option to charge at them, your pullman better be better than theirs. Uh, otherwise, you're going to lose. That doesn't sound like a great plan, does it? Like relying on the fact that you have a better pullman unless you know for a fact your pullman's better. It's not great to just charge them. So you want to create opportunities again. Baiting is fantastic. If you create an opportunity that someone thinks they can make a difference, you've now created another situation. So if black, if this green ringed black enemy here decides that it is the best opportunity for them because red has stepped away from his pole, that their best option to get the kill is to charge the, the Pullman. The Pullman has to recognize that and just rotate behind their close defenseman, keep attacking, and let Red crash back in and destroy this person because they're facing these two, and Red is now by themselves, essentially. They stepped out of the fray, and no one went after them, so they can either turn and burn and run around, or make sure they crush this person and you've created another 3v2, which has a weak side. The pole doesn't have as much defense as the boardman, so you crush that pole, you finish out the fight. Um, that, that mechanic is going to work 
as you increase in size as well. Just getting people to run the poll because it's a scary thing. If they decide to take the balls to do it, you can punish them for it. If they step the wrong way, if they take the wrong directions, they decide this is a better opportunity um, to do it solo than it is to do it as a team. Uh, it's There's different ways to bait them into different things. And there is also... If you step out here and bait and they decide, yeah, this is my best option is to come after this. Well, if the red recognizes that they're being engaged, if they can get this person to turn even a little bit, because their board is on this side. Let's put a board there so we can identify that. Uh, I'm trying to get to rotate now. We'll just do this. So their board's on this side, which means their sword's on this side, and there's a lot of open space in this pocket right here for the pullman to just take a half step and throw into that player. Now, when they do this, they have to keep, there's an important aspect. They have to make sure that their other defenseman knows that's what they're doing, because otherwise... You still have your two people crashing. Because all of this, this entire encounter of combat is going to happen in 6, 10, 12 seconds. It's going to be a lot of activity in a very short period of time. So although these seem simple, they're going to be very difficult to get off without practicing and without timing. So if, if you can make this opportunity, make this pocket available, Brown has to know that they have to defend and for a little bit, it is going to be a 2v1. But as long as they know that that's happening, they only have to survive for a second or two. They survive that 2v1 for a second. They step back. They retreat a little bit. The, the pole resets. And now we've created a 3v2 once again because this minion opened up the opportunity. And it works either side. Um, but the majority of our players in our game are right-handed. So their sword is in their right hand, their board is in their left. If they turn, if they turn so that their board is facing the outside for the most or facing away, the pullman is most likely going to have their uh their pole is going to be in their back hand is going to be their right hand, their front hand is going to be their left. So that stabbing is going to go into pockets. Or sorry. Other way around. So that's going to go into the pockets of the player. So your right hand is on top. Your left hand is your back. So when that person comes up against you, we'll do this as an example. You want to match your pole on their sword side because there's more availability to hit on that sword side than there is on the board side. And that counts for when they're going down the line. If we make a bunch of these... you're going to hit their poles this way, but everyone else this way means that their boards are facing the wrong direction for you. So everybody for the wrong direction for them. So all of their poles on this side, you just slide past that board. You can hit those pockets. Which is kind of why... Uh, which is why you want to pay attention to who you're facing on the opposite side. You want to try to match your pole hand to the closest to the, the majority of the pockets of the opponent. Okay. Let's move back to our standard three V three positioning. Okay. Um, this position, by the way, uh, if I mention it later, is called cock and balls because it is a pole between two boards. That's what it looks like. Uh, it's very easy to move this positioning around because all you have to do is make sure is the, the pole leads the directions. If they need to retreat back, they feel like they need to pull everyone back. They just have to say, you know, retreat, backstep sidestep whatever and the these two should know to move with them it's only three people and really what it is is the 
boardmen need to know where the poleman is and move in reaction to him. Otherwise, or to them. Otherwise, they're not paying attention to anything besides keeping the people in front of them uh, either occupied or killing them if they have the opportunity. But the pole is going to do most of your damage. Uh, once again, turn and burn in this works as well. You just have to make sure that you pick the advantage, the advantageous side for you. So if we give our yellow here a board and we try to turn and burn this way, we now have put ourselves, we've put the yellow between ourselves and the pole of maroon which unless they've practiced, unless the Pullman has practiced the action of lifting the pole up over their players' heads and bringing it back down effectively in like a timely and, and effective manner, they're going to probably get tangled up or they're going to have to spin the other way, which runs them into this. So you've now created a 2v1 again for at least a couple of seconds. If they've practiced that, you might be a little bit more screwed. But you've also made sure that you're moving towards the pocket of yellow. So the pole can keep throwing shots, and if yellow doesn't turn with you, they're going to get killed. All red has to do is just make sure that this guy is occupied. If they decide that it's a better bet to deal with uh, these two, if, if this pole decides I'm going to take the advantage and try to go after the one, That's great. That means that red has to recognize that and step back a little bit. Because now brown and white, our pole and our defenseman, can just take out yellow. And now whose back is facing us? It's once again, this is about battlefield awareness and trying to just make as many opportunities as possible. There are answers to all of these, but they all require more additional teamwork. Uh, for example, in this scenario, you're splitting the team. You're trying to get people to turn their backs against each other. Maybe the best bet is to literally move the entire team through and rotate back and try to reset. Or try to move back and re -counter and counter flank them, essentially. So they've done that. You split off. Oh, I got just that. They split off and try to take this out. There's different opportunities, but for the most part, your tactics are kind of just going to be mirrored of each other and trying to get whoever, trying to be whoever's effective at these styles is going to win the fights more often, which is where the teamwork comes into play. If you know how to move with your team, you know how to make an effective uh, maneuver, you know how to work with your team and make sure that if they run that line against you, they run that turn and burn, that split. Your pole knows how to lift that pole up, be a threat in the process, and bring it back down real quick, and still be in position. You're in a better position. You're in a better spot. Um. Yeah. Any questions so far? No. Okay. Uh, we're gonna keep chugging away then. Uh, so now we're going to move on to 4v4s. And this is where you add your quote-unquote support or additional DPS. Um, now we get to have uh, our baits become more effective, our turn and burns become more effective, uh, our crossovers and our switching is going to be very... It's going to be an option again, because right now in the, in the three position, 3v3s, crossing over each other doesn't help that much because you still want your defenseman on the outside and your pullman in the middle. Um, if you cross over, it's mostly to make sure you get a kill or because someone is wildly out of place. That's what most of your crossovers are going to be in the 3v3s. In the 4v4s, you now open up a fourth player to switch things around, move as you want, and uh, create more opportunities. Because your defense is solid. In a 3v3, your defense is pretty solid. In a 4v4, you have a good defense with three of them and somebody to terrify and move 
the opponents as well. Um, in this scenario, we have purple with flow, mainly because it's offensive and uh, it's it's easy to team up with any other members of the, the group. Um, it does cause a little bit of a trick with pole, but it does allow for a lot of offensive uh, abilities and they're a definite threat. So they're going to cause some, some problems. Uh, for the most part, you're going to do the same stuff, except instead of having one of your defensemen coming out and around, your support is going to be the one creating the baits. Um, or they're going to be creating a distraction. If they come up, they step up, and they get one and the attention of a second, that means that this can happen. These two might see that opportunity and try to crash it, which means we can flank. They have to make the decision there immediately. Your team already knows what's happening, so they're going to pay attention. They're going to turn and back up, and now this team has to make a decision. Red, or sorry, maroon and black green have to make the decision who they're dealing with, and they've already put themselves in the wrong position because even if you're over here, it's still a 1v1, and this pole has to make the decision. If they decide they want to go after red, our brown and our pole step back up and get that shot. If green steps up too much, red can either keep drawing them out so that pole has to stick with them or come back. Um, it's, it's mainly split your team, split your opponent's team in a way that gives openings for your DPSs or your supports. Um, your pole being the DPS and your, your, uh, your flow or your support also creating opportunities is going to make, is going to make a lot of opportunities for that pole to take things over. And it's, it's not even that this has to win. Like the flow does not have to win this fight at all. They have to make them annoyed, concerned, and move. That's it. If, the, if this, if you know, uh, if you know that this player, for example, if we put, if we put Lily deathly sunshine on this side people are gonna go to him because he's a threat they know he's a threat he's very quick he's very fast and he's gonna be a problem so they're gonna put one or two people on him to try to deal with him great that means that he never has to actually kill either of them he's created a 2v1 where he just has to keep them busy while his other three teammates deal with two people he's created an opportunity where his team's advantage of numbers is going to outplay or should outplay the opponent's smaller numbers. Um, that is a lot of team fighting when you start getting into larger numbers. It doesn't matter if you win your little skirmishes. It matters if you can pull people away to create opportunities. So we're going to reset this real quick. Because here's why, if they don't, if this person isn't somebody they think is a threat, they're really not going to learn anything from this. But they, they're, I mean, they're going to learn something from this. They're going to have a problem. If this person comes up, if our support flow on the side, doesn't matter which side, by the way, it can be either side. It's just, it's normally easier to do it on the sword side of your opponents. So on your left side, because if they turn, um, the if they turn away they sorry yeah if they turn away they're going to create an opening on the pullman or they're going to create an opening on their uh their team whoever leaves is creating an opening on that sword side and that sword side for most right hand players or for most players which are right handed that sword side is going to be the opening your pull is going to want to take advantage of so if they if they decide to ignore this warrior let's say it's somebody that you think is a threat, but not, you know, warlord level threat. They deal with this person and they only send one. And now it's a pretty standard 3v3. Except our player knows their goal is not to win that fight. Their goal is to move this player as far out of position as possible. 
and cause stress. That's it. So if they send one player and that player, they're equal, they're off here. We have a 3v3. We do our standard 3v3 things. We either bait and switch or bait and crush or uh, try the turn and burn, which you can pick somebody up on the side. Uh, it's it's opportunities. Um, so if they don't send someone or they don't pay attention, this is going to go very poorly for them, mainly because they just allowed a flanker past their line. They, this, this is a one fight. If you get somebody behind their line, it is very hard for them to defend against that. Cause now they have two fronts. They have to defend. There's only four people. Four people cannot defend two fronts effectively without being really, really good. Um, and that's, so there's a reason I call it, that's the main reason I call this as a support is because their job is to support the 3v3. They're not support quote unquote all the time, but they can be. If you're looking at like class build, uh, your healer is going to be your support, but you probably want them with a board and, you know, being more protective and defensive and just being a body. And the support role is going to be another DPS, like a warrior with two sticks. They're very versatile. They can deal with a lot of situations. They're very hard to kill and they can create pressure in places the healer really can't because the healers most likely doesn't have six points of armor and things like that. Uh, yeah. Um, that is most of the basics with five. It's the same kind of thing, except you add, ideally you add another, uh, either another defense or another DPS. You can run two poles. You can run to whatever and you can switch these weapons up as you want i just recommend you have a pole because that range gives you so many opportunities um but it you create a secondary uh i have another character i believe we'll do pink even though they're called puzzle in 5v5s is the same thing your 3v3s are very solid you know where your 3v3s are going you know what they do your two extras are going to help defend or cause opportunities. Getting them to move out of position is the main goal of basically everyone that's not defending the pole or defending your main DPS or support. Now, in a class game, your main pole, quote unquote, your main pole might be a wizard. If that wizard's got a bunch of fingers of death, people aren't prepped for him, people aren't prepped for the lightning bolts, the fireballs, all that stuff, they could be your DPS. You gotta defend them. They don't have armor most likely, but they're gonna be able to do the most damage from uh, from range. So those might be your option. Archery, it's a little harder because we get in the way of their shots. Um, but in, in small teams, I don't recommend taking an archer of any kind, mainly because you've now removed someone from being able to be a threat. So if we have, and this doesn't have to be an archer class. This is just a person with a bow. If we have an archer on our team, we have essentially created a four, a four man fight with an extra threat. And that extra threat is not consistent and it's not constant. So in, in these small teams, that bow is going to create most likely more problems because they can't be the defenseman and they can only kind of be the outside pressure. They can be the main DPS, but once again, they need to be defended and they can't really cause that much consistent threat because they have to reload. Unless you've got, you know, six shots a second or six shots every five seconds or something like that, you're not going to be as efficient as somebody with a speed pull that can just keep like smack, 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 smack on somebody else's shield. Um, it's also a lot easier to enchant melee weapons and it is to enchant bows because you know like flame blade and imbue weapon work on melee you can't enchant a bow with anything besides harden and then it just blocks shots but that doesn't help it deal damage so in small teams i'm going to most likely recommend you avoid the bows mainly because it's just removing a person from your your plan that person can can help 
but they're not going to be as effective as, as if they just had two sticks or they have uh, a stick and a small shield or something like that. So if, you're, if your druid wants to bring a bow and have that opportunity to bring it, great. Leave it someplace on the field or give it to someone else to hold so that you can wield that board because that's most likely going to be more effective or the pole. It's going to be mostly, it's going to be more effective in the small team than it is on the large team. Um, when we work in large teams, bows are great. They're a con they're they're a threat that can be effective. It's just in small teams, if players know what they're doing, they're gonna crash that bow and they have to block one shot. Because as soon as that one shot gets off, you have two or three seconds before you can get that next shot off, or a second or whatever. And that's gonna be tricky to do when someone is running you down. And then you don't have a lot of threat against them once they crash you. Is this all making sense? Are we good? Um, do we have any questions? Comments, concerns, things we want to run through. This question is about bows in small team, how to utilize them, where they can fit, uh, classes that could be using them, and if it's better or not for a druid to use them or not use them. Uh, you can see how that question gets answered. I just realized, I think the stream is showing my stuff backwards. That's interesting. Okay. Uh, I don't know why. Um, yeah, the, I mean, the bow can be effective from longer range, but once you get into, you know, 30 feet, that bow has a lot shorter time or has a lot longer refractory time than a sword does. And it also doesn't offer any defensive capabilities because, I mean, even if you have it hardened, we're not supposed to block with our bows. So it can't act like a shield. It just normally is going to kind of fall out uh, and, and cause more problems than, than benefits. Um, are there any configurations people want to talk about, like team orientations or equipment or uh, setups? We can also just run through scenarios. Like if if you are thinking about comprising a team or what to do in certain scenarios where you've had you've been screwed in the past, like uh you take a warder healer and you end up with two barbarians and an assassin. That kind of sucks. Uh it doesn't mean you're useless, it just means that two of your players are no longer affected by your stuff or your main your main gig. Um I think and, and this is a this is a cultural thing more than anything. I think players should be allowed to, once they get their team, they should be allowed to change their spell list. They shouldn't be allowed to change their class, but they should be allowed to change their spell list to adapt to what their players have on their team. Because otherwise, you could end up like, hey, I'm a Paragon Druid and I played Candy, and I ended up with nobody that wanted enchantments. So my entire ability to do anything was negated. So even though I was a Paragon and, I, and like I'm a great player, I couldn't do anything. And if it's a warrior crashing you, awe them or, you know, get one of your other members to do something else to them. Because if a, if a warrior is crashing you and they have full six points, the pole's going to get a couple shots off, but they may not be able to leg that person or stop them in their tracks. They're going to need some assistance, but it's very hard for a warrior by themselves to defend or attack when there are casters in CC in play. They need assistance. Um, so we put Paladin, we put Jory as a Paladin with a pole. Uh, choosing your pole is also important. So the dungeon's not very large. The rooms are about 20-ish feet if they go off of the last time we did dungeons. So a six-foot pole is a little bit short because it just puts people just outside range, and it means they only have to take a step to charge the pole. An eight- or nine-foot pole is about right for this because it's A, light enough, B, it's long enough that they have to take two or three steps to get past it, and it still offers a large enough threat that you can kind of pull it back and still get some shots off after the first or second step. So we went with an eight-foot speed pull. Um, Hopper wanted to play warrior or anti-paladin. Initially, we had her as an anti-paladin because of immunities. We already have built-in immunities for Jory with command and death, so getting Hopper 
built-in immunities of flame and command means that we're cutting off a lot of magic that could affect us. Ultimately, we decided to push for more armor and more longevity in that armor. So um, even though Anti-Paladin has some nice abilities, we were not going to use the Undead Minion. We may be able to use some of the other things. The Poison Weapon is kind of nice, but it's a one-shot kill in a minion dungeon that may not mean that much. Like against a boss, that could be really cool. You know, we blow his armor off his arm and we shoot him with a, a pole arm with a, or a hit with a sword with a, a one hit kill, a poison weapon. That's really cool. Um, but it doesn't always work. Ultimately, we went with the warrior for more points of armor, ancestral armor, and the fact that Hopper going off and being our support player running uh, tricks and causing openings they're going to be so much more effective as a warrior because they're self-sufficient with their armor. They get some kills, they get scavenged. They don't have to defend themselves because the armor will do that for them. So our support player, our additional DPS is a warrior in this plan. Um, I had to fill a role. I am the utility slash second defenseman. Originally, we had me as a bard, but... We ran into the problem that even though I can wear armor as a bard and my songs are very defensive and I can control some more magic and I have more CC, we still leave Nike without armor. So we built uh, towards Druid instead so that I can wear my magical armor. I can give Nike some magical armor. I can also enchant Jory as a paladin or enchant Hopper as a paladin to give them more killing power or more defense. Um, between Nike having some warding enchantments and me having some armor enchantments, we could deal with most situations and get demagged once or twice and still be very effective. Um, it also opens up an interesting kill shot. Very few boss monsters are immune to fire. Call lightning is a, I don't care what you are, you died spell. So... If we walk into a room and it's a lich and he goes, I'm immune to death and command. I'm like, great. How about fire? And he says, no, I kill him and we win. End of questions. Like, unless the designer has taken that into effect and has planned around that, Call Lightning gets around a lot of boss minions or like boss fights because they're just not immune to fire and Call Lightning doesn't care. So, uh, Druid's got some secret weapons in there for dungeons and quests that are really entertaining. Um, I ended up going with a, uh, ranger build. No, sorry. Was it a ranger build? No, it was not a ranger build. Um, but I ended up with a punch small Madu, uh, partially because it's the equipment I have partially because a Madu gives you a little bit more surface area for defense and, um, can still benefit from some additional enchantments it can also be targeted by different things so that's an uh, another issue to run into but it's it's a little bit of everything on that one um and then it's a short sword it's a punch modu so i can switch back and forth left or right to adapt to our situation that we need um like he's got sword and board jory's got his pole and the flails a backup and hopper's got a two stick plus additional sticks when they get heated or broken or something either way um with that in mind, we didn't have many scenarios that we were going to run into or we thought we would run into that would actually cause us problems. We have a solid 3v3 using uh, Jor as our middle, Nike as our left, and myself as our right. I realize it's switched on the stream, so switch that for the stream, I guess. But And then Hopper can go off and do things. If we need to do a puzzle, we need to split the party. Um, it's very easy for Jory to stick with me because I'm very mobile and Hopper to go with Nike because they can support each other. And, uh, if Hopper gets targeted by CC magic, Nike has some releases and things like that to get her out of that situation. She also has the heels to keep them both running. Um, so if we had to split the party to go deal with a puzzle, we could go do that. Uh, if we had to have a like individual player dealing with a puzzle the whole time. Um, 
based on our skill sets, I'm decent at puzzles. Hopper can step in and be a defenseman because they have so much armor. Six points. I think we're getting to five points. Five points is a lot of armor to deal with. And even though they're flow, they're still a defenseman because it's hard to get through five points, especially when it's ancestral and immune to a bunch of stuff. Um, we had a bait and switch option as well. Uh, and this could go either direction. It's most, it's better off on this side because then we're not risking Nike. If we're risking our healer, we're probably doing something wrong. So we'd risk me as the Druid and try to get the enemy to come in and crash on Jory. And I would step back in and Jory and I would crush the enemy. Hopper can still go run off and do what they need to. Um, if we need to do this on the other side, Hopper and Nike pull a crossover with the board stepping in front. Hopper comes in. We'd pull the opening. This would be just switched. So Hopper and Nike would both step a little bit away. Somebody would crash Jory. Hopper steps back in, takes them out. We've now created an additional opportunity. Um, yeah. Any questions? Selection of pre-approved spell list. Um, Weez, are you talking about like when you're building the battle game, you have to, or you're building your your spell list before the battle game, you have to uh, make your spell list and then your team can screw you over regardless? Uh, this question is about building and adapting lists after teams are built. Um, we kind of go back and forth on this a little bit, so I'm going to cut out some of the additional questions that just say, hey, my park does it this way, and then somebody else contradicting and saying, well, my park is the other way. We go back and forth for a little bit and kind of tell where those are. I think that works really well. I just, especially with the fact that uh, orders of battle include a lot of wording about teamwork, I think it's very, if, if, it's counterproductive if we require them to pick what they're going to, like how they're going to play before they have their team, because that's counterproductive to teamwork. If we're, we want to enforce and push teamwork, we should let people do teamwork. So creating an opportunity so that you get your class, you get like, you pick your class, you get picked on a team, and then you pick your style of play based on that team is going to create better issue at better, uh, points of teamwork than if you're, you're stuck with whatever list you decided to build that day. Yeah, you're good. Keep going. I agree with that. I think it's a good idea. I'm a fan of it. I like it. I think it's a good idea. I think we should do it on a national level as well. Um, like in, uh, include it in the, the rules of play so that we don't run into the problems that people have different interpretations of what the game is, essentially. Any other questions, comments, concerns? We got about four minutes left. Uh, this last question is about how, getting to fight with your friends. We've been talking about small team tactics, and you know, when you build tactics in small teams, you want to be able to fight in those small teams. And not everyone gets that opportunity to fight in small teams on a regular basis. And the person asking this question is asking, how do you allow game runners or help game runners be able to let you fight with your friends on an everyday basis? And then you can see where I answer that. So, uh... If you're the champion, you have all of the opportunities in the world. If you're the champion of a park, you can create battle games and try to balance battle games around friends. So, like, um, I'm not saying every single battle game, but uh, one or two a day, especially if you're doing short battle games, allow friends to fight together and then try to balance against it. So, uh, I mean, if, if Lily Sunshine and Morpheus want to fight together, that's a real hard thing to balance against but you could just make the numbers different. So yes, they Lily and, and Morpheus get to fight together and they're on one team, but the other team has four more players. They may not be good players, but they're four more players. That's Those are bodies. Um, as for uh, leadership, like the, the monarchy and things like that, encouraging 2v2 aspects into your tournaments, 3v3s, 4v4s, or just switching up like your regular like bear pit or ditches into two man forevers, three man forevers, uh, small team fights and emph like emphasize on small team fights, just switching up the everyday once a month to a team fight will push that teamwork. Um, 
you can also do things similar to uh, um, uh, Magic the Gathering's Emperor style, where it's like kill the king, and you do it in groups of three or groups of four, where there is a king, and then everybody else has to defend that king in that team and try to get things going. Um, allowing players to work with their friends in that scenario is another good option. Uh, a lot of this comes with if you have one bad battle game or one battle game that some people don't have as much fun in as the rest, if you have a bunch more battle games, it's a lot easier for them to ignore that one downfall than to play two battle games a day and one of them was off balanced. So the other thing would be push as many battle games as possible in your daily barks. Anything else? Any other questions, comments, concerns? All right. I think we're going to wrap up. Thank you all for joining me on this uh aggressive run through on team battles this has been another episode of the paragon path thanks for listening if you enjoy what we do please drop us a like subscribe some comments anything even a review that helps us reach more people that like this content the more people we get on the platform the more people we get commenting the more people we can get on the path so stick with it if you have any ideas or would like to be on the path yourself don't be afraid to reach out I've got plenty of openings and plenty of episodes to still run. So if you think you've got an idea for it, reach out. We'll see if we can get you on. As always, stay on the path. Hope to see you on the field.